doing it. The committee will come to order. Without objection, all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. To our witnesses, welcome to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you for your time and expertise this morning, and welcome to members of the public and the press as well. We're holding this hearing today for one reason, because President Trump uh, cut the very funding that would reduce the flow of immigrants from Central America, which he says concerns him so much. We need to shine a light on this unwise decision, and I look forward to our witness testimony. Because we're short on time with the upcoming vote series, I'm going to enter my full statement into the record. But first, I want to thank our ranking member, Mr. McCall of Texas. His urgency and leadership on this <clears throat> issue helped put it at the top of the committee's agenda, including this very timely hearing. So before I introduce our witnesses, I'd like to yield to him for his opening comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Northern Triangle countries of Central America continue to face serious economic and security challenges that are threatening the region's stability and driving illegal immigration to the United States. This migration from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras is exacerbating the crisis on our southern border and straining the capacity of DHS's uh, customs and board protection. As a former chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, I understand the unique challenges we face at our border and am committed to using all tools at our disposal to address this crisis. One of the most effective tools we have for responding to this is targeted foreign assistance to Central America. This assistance supports the Northern Triangle countries' efforts to combat transnational criminal organizations like MS-13 that are involved in the trafficking of persons and drugs. U.S. assistance also promotes economic prosperity and strengthens democratic institutions and rules of law. This assistance merges uh, security and economic support to create stability in the region and address the root causes of illegal immigration. The Northern Triangle countries have also responded with their own initiative called the Alliance for Prosperity to complement U.S. assistance, demonstrating their commitment to addressing their own challenges. Our assistance is having positive results. Uh, the chairman and I went down there. Uh, we were in El Salvador. We saw it throughout the region. USAID programs are increasing agriculture production, increasing household incomes, creating jobs, 78,000 jobs in Guatemala alone. Other U.S. assistance programs funded through State's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement directly support police enforcement operations, including those by vetted units like the FBI's Transnational Anti-Gang TAG units and DHS's Transnational Criminal Investigation units. Both have been contributed to the indictments of hundreds of MS-13 gang members, the prosecution of criminal organizations and uh, collection of biometric data and in individuals su suspected of terrorism, violent crime, and trafficking through bitmap. Last month, I traveled uh, again with Chairman Engel to El Salvador, and we witnessed firsthand how our assistance is driving at-risk youth away from criminal gangs like MS-13 by providing technical skills and employment opportunities. During our visit, we had the pleasure of meeting with President-elect of El Salvador, who expressed his unwavering commitment to working with the United States in every way possible to address the migration crisis. He also explained China's efforts to increase its presence in his country, but he favors closer engagement with the United States. Cutting this aid, in my judgment, would create a void that China is prepared to fill. And we heard that from the president of El Salvador. As a representative from Texas, this crisis on the border is taking place in my backyard, and I share the president's frustration. However, I acknowledge that more work and time is needed to fully address Central America's challenges and the continued migration flows to the United States. I believe that the decision to cut funding will make the economic and security situations in Central America 
worse, not better, triggering more migration, not less, to the United States. I also recognize that Congress has an oversight role. And I've, played, I've made this clear by establishing a process which clarifies that we have cr the criteria to address 16 congressional concerns related to improving border security, anti-corruption, and human rights. In short, our trip to Latin America was significant. Meeting with the President of Colombia, <clears throat> meeting with the President of El Salvador, I think the Chairman and I came back realizing these programs are highly effective and that uh, cutting these programs would be counterproductive and make uh, the situation worse, not better. Um, and so I, 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 I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing at my request uh, after we came back. Uh, I mean, I'll just anecdotally just share the story. The president of El Salvador, we were there the day the president decided to cut the foreign aid. And it was quite a, quite a shock to an ally, someone who's pro-United States, wants to be our ally. Uh, I think it's the wrong message at the wrong time. And I, I think this uh, is ill-advised, it's reckless, um, and I look forward to the testimony, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McCall. And, um, Thank you for your leadership. Um, we are largely holding this hearing, uh, this hearing to this morning because of you, um, because we were so shocked uh, sitting there in El Salvador at a time when the edicts came down to cut foreign aid. Um, it just was so logical that it was the opposite thing that we should do, not, not cut aid. We should improve aid if we want to make uh, situations uh, where people don't come to the United States, then we need to help them uh, in their own country. Um, it doesn't um, do anything except make the problem worse uh, by cutting aid. More people will wind up coming to, to this country. And the President says that's not what he wants. Well, sometimes you have to figure out uh, is, the, is the cure you know, worse than the, than the problem? And uh, I certainly think it is. So I want to thank you, uh, Mr. McCall, and we said we would do a um, hearing as soon as we could, and I think this is a, re a record uh, time hearing, but it's largely because of, um, of you, and I thank you for it. So this morning, uh, we're joined by a distinguished panel. I'm pleased first to welcome m my friend, Ambassador Roberta Jacobson. Roberta and I have worked together for many years, and she is truly one of the best diplomats of our time. Roberta, it's great to have you back. Uh, the ambassador is a Korea State Department official, most recently serving as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico from 2016 to 2018. Ambassador Jacobson previously served as Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. So welcome, Roberta. Mr. Gil Kurlikowski, did I get that right? Okay is a distinguished visiting fellow and professor from Northeastern University. From 2014 to 2017, Mr. Kurlikowski served as Commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Prior to his appointment to CBP, he served as the Director of the White House Office <coughs> of National Drug Control Policy from 2009 to 2014. And before that was the Chief of Police of Seattle, Washington. Ambassador Roger Noriega is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Ambassador Noriega previous, previously served as Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, as well as U.S. Ambassador to the OAS from 2001-2005. He's been uh, testifying for many, many years at this committee, and we thank you for it, Ambassador. And what I'm going to do now is I'll recognize uh, our witnesses for five minutes each to summarize your testimony, and we'll start with Ambassador Jacobson. Thank you, Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall and members of this committee. It's, it's a pleasure to appear before you today 
for the first time as a private citizen. It's a, it's a different feeling. Um, but mostly I'd like to thank you all for the interest that you've shown in this subject that we're going to discuss today and to which I've devoted my professional career. I have a long paragraph about some of the issues that drive migration in Central America, but I think most of you know those, and I'll let my written testimony stand on that. But I will say that because of both economic and security issues in the Northern Triangle countries, um, decisions by Central American migrants to leave their countries and attempt to reach the United States, often to join family members who are already here, even when they're taken by family units with young children, can be seen as a rational decision when they're confronted with extreme poverty and violence. Unfortunately, migration policy by this administration appears based on the assumption that if one makes things difficult enough for migrants, they will not come. Whether zero tolerance, family separation, threats to cut off aid or close the U.S.-Mexican border, such policies are wrongheaded, needlessly cruel, and frankly all but useless as long as the root causes of migration remain unaddressed. There's often a misunderstanding of the purpose of U.S. aid, not by this committee but by our, our public. It has always been intended to advance U.S. interests and objectives. Indeed, within the assistance that the administration intends to stop, intends to stop are programs carried out by the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, Treasury, and on many issues directly relevant to our national security and safety. It's also important to recognize that the vast majority of our assistance to the Northern Triangle and Mexico does not go directly to governments. It is projectized, as we say, or destined for non-governmental organizations or very specific projects or equipments if within government and designed in coordination with the United States and only for the purpose intended. Thus, any threat to cut assistance can be seen as reducing support for our own objectives. And the ranking member mentioned both the TAG program, the FBI's anti-gang program, and our biometric programs, which do just that. So the fact is, as a former colleague of mine has said, if you like the current migration crisis, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because if aid is cut off to the Northern Triangle, it is almost guaranteed that we will see more, not fewer migrants attempting to enter the US, and they will be poorer, more desperate, and victims of greater violence than they are with our aid. All of the programs that are pending cuts right now have basically just gotten underway in missions where we had downsized or eliminated our aid mission. So if you cut aid for FY17 or 18, you would never really have given an aggressive aid program, as was developed at the end of the last administration, a chance to be implemented. And foreign officials in these countries are confused and frustrated with the fickle and inconsistent nature of our policy. The Honduran government expressed irritation with the announced cutoff, and Mexico's National Migration Com Commissioner called it schizophrenic. But there are other reasons it's in our interest to continue and improve our assistance. It gives us a seat at the table to leverage decisions taken by those governments on issues of direct relevance to national security, and because if others become the partner of choice for these hemispheric countries, they will do so without any of the conditions or policy goals that we require of aid recipients. So in closing, I would just say that humane policies that uphold American values do not mean letting in every petitioner. Economic migrants do not qualify for asylum, and they should understand that for them, the perilous journey north will ultimately be fruitful. But returning migrants to their home countries more quickly, while usually one of the most effective ways to transmit that the, the journey is for naught, requires the cooperation of those governments. Here, too, our po constantly changing policy and blame game makes that cooperation more difficult. So I look forward to um, any, answering any questions the committee may have about the importance of maintaining this assistance, because it is in our own national interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Kurlikowski. Good morning, Chairman and Ranking Member McCall and the distinguished members. It's a pleasure also to be here for the first time as a citizen 
uh, uh, although I certainly miss the government service and, and the work that was done. When I became commissioner of CBP, I was the, the only confirmed commissioner for uh, President Obama's eight years. And in the March of 2014, uh, within a week, I became intimately familiar with what a surge looks like. And certainly the ranking member uh, was there many times with me at, in uh, McAllen, Texas, uh, which was the primary source of 68 thousand unaccompanied children and family units uh, coming into the United States. I praised then and I praise now uh, the work of the United States Border Patrol. Uh, the men and women in the Border Patrol really with very little assistance from other entities of the federal government uh, were able to feed, to clothe, uh, to hold people. And for all of us that have been in those border patrol stations, you know they're designed for a very short period of time. And yet uh, some of this went on for six and seven and eight days uh, with people being there. I also recognized clearly that we did not have the resources uh, to deal with this. The Border Patrol had recognized over the last two years that this surge was increased, or that this, these numbers were increasing. But we didn't have any of the support and backup. So by the time that surge ended uh, at the end of that summer, it was very helpful to have purchased a large warehouse, certainly not the best facility for holding people, uh, but certainly something that was needed. It was important to secure contracts for food, for health care, for security, so that Border Patrol agents could be returned back to the border uh, rather than doing some of that work. But I also saw the humanitarian efforts of those agents uh, as they brought clothing in from their own children uh, to help take care of some of these uh, of, of some of these kids. Well, I've spent a career in law enforcement, and I am intimately familiar with with what mean what what are the important parts of safety and security. And when people feel safe and secure, if they have a trust in government, uh, just as in the United States, well, the people in Central America are not going to want to make the very dangerous trek. And we worked hard with the State Department to do the advertisements in a variety of ways in those three Central American countries to say your chances of entering the United States without being detained are minimal, but the route and the trek would be incredibly dangerous, not only for us assault, for robbery, uh, for homicide, for sexual assault, uh, uh, and we did a lot of advertising in a variety of ways, and it had very little impact because, as Ambassador Jacobson had, had mentioned also, when you're facing uh, economic problems of, of great uh, importance to people there, you're facing the dangers, and you're also facing uh, that inability to get your children a better quality of life. Uh, you're willing to make that dangerous trek. That's why I'm such a strong proponent of what we can do. We saw the plan Colombia uh, reduce co uh, cocaine. We saw Merida uh, have significant impacts on the number of people leaving Mexico to come into the United States. And these new programs that are, that are really just in, in many ways in their infancy in the three Central American countries need our support and they need our recognition. There's no one single a, uh, answer to to the crisis that is now occurring on the on the southern border, but certainly uh, eliminating uh, foreign aid would uh, would be, in my opinion, a huge mistake. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Noriega. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCall, other distinguished members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, President Trump's decision to cut U.S. aid to Central America's northern triangle countries apparently was a reaction to data showing over 90,000 inbound migrants in March, up dramatically from 70,000 in February. The surge is coming from countries where the police are outgunned by gangs, where local authorities are bullied or bought off by narco-traffickers, and where the jobs are destroyed by flagging economies and costly two-year drought. It's not just about how many are arriving, but who is arriving, and that complicates enforcement measures. For example, there is a 370 percent increase in the number of people arriving in family units in March of 2019 compared to last year. The prevalence of unaccompanied minors or those applying for political asylum is higher, too. 
There is also a great increase in the number arriving in larger groups. It is clear that criminal smugglers are gaming our system. They know that if my immigrants arrive in groups of 70 or more, border authorities are quickly overwhelmed. They know, too, that there is a backlog of 850,000 asylum claims that are pending, so that those claims will take time. And all of these factors increase the likelihood of would-be migrants being released into the United States. So the surge isn't just about the conditions back home. It has a lot to do with the system that they encounter when they reach our border. Uh, nevertheless, treating the root causes of illegal migration and attacking immigrant smuggling networks uh, can make a, a difference in the challenge at the border uh, more man manageable. Mr. Chairman, before President Trump's announcement, the United States planned to spend about $450 million this year in the Northern Triangle countries. That sum is less than one-tenth of what taxpayers will spend this year to deploy Border Patrol and military units on the southwest border. But $450 million is still a lot of money, and since 2016, we spent about $2.6 billion on programs in these countries, but the people keep coming. So it's fair to ask if we're getting an adequate return on our investment uh, or if we are improving the conditions of those people who are fleeing Central America. I believe we are. In at-risk communities in Honduras, for example, policing and youth programs managed by USAID and the State Department's INL Bureau are credited with cutting homicide rates in half since 2011 in Honduras, with dramatic improvements in major city of San Pedro Sula. In Guatemala, USAID has supported anti-extortion initiatives of local prosecutors. These efforts have led to dramatic increases in the number of successful prosecutions for extortion, jumping from 41 to 300 in a, in a, in a three-year period. USAID's partnership with INL supports El Salvador's security efforts, including, uh, I'm sorry, leading to a 45% reduction in the number of homicides in targeted municipalities. In neighborhoods with USAID programs, 51% fewer residents reported incidents of extortion, blackmail, or murders. INL supports Operation Regional Shield, which has led to the arrest of nearly 4,000 gang members in the United States and in the region, produced charges against nearly 300 gang members in Guatemala, for example, and helped dismantle uh, gang cliques in El Salvador. Uh, USAID also uh, addresses underlying economic instability. Due to USAID programs supporting agriculture and natural resources management, impoverished rural areas in Guatemala and elsewhere have seen more jobs and higher salaries. In El Salvador, uh, USAID programs help micro, small, and medium enterprises create more jobs and increase productivity. Mr. Chairman, the American people should know that these USAID dollars do not go to foreign governments. They support programs that are earmarked by this Congress, monitored by this committee, and designed and implemented uh, by State Department and USAID professionals on the front lines in these countries. Congress has a pivotal role playing, uh, in play, to play in ensuring robust funding for foreign assistance programs that serve our national security interests. It's also not just about aid. Ten years ago, the United States advocated the CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, to secure market access and fuel long-term economic growth. The United States promoted this trade agreement with the promise of growing market for American exports and mutually beneficial investment opportunities. However, it's fair to say that the Northern Triangle countries are less competitive than they were before NAFTA. We have to do better. U.S. stakeholders should work to restore a broad bipartisan consensus behind free market policies, representative democracy, and the rule of law as the engines of growth in Central America. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, much of the damage that we see to the institutions in Central America is driven by narco-trafficking that's fueled by uh, demand for illicit narcotics in this country. I don't think there's a leader in the region who wouldn't trade all of our aid dollars for a reduction in the uh, demand uh, for illicit uh, drugs that uh, decimates their institutions and undermines uh, their ability to grow uh, as good partners with the United States. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks to uh, all three of you. Uh, I'll now recognize my, my members for five minutes each to ask questions, starting with myself. All time yielded is only for the purpose of questioning the witnesses. So let me start, uh, Ambassador Jacobson. Um, I was struck when we, I read your testimony by your discussion of China 
and to the extent in which the administration seems to be opening the door to the Chinese and other global powers who obviously don't share our values by cutting off U.S. assistance to the Northern Triangle countries. As you know, Guatemala, excuse me one moment, let me just do this. As you know, Guatemala and Honduras are among the 17 countries in the world that maintain a formal diplomatic relationship with Taiwan over China. Just last year, El Salvador broke relations with Taiwan and recognized China. I had an excellent meeting with Salvadoran President-elect Bukele when I was in the region, and as you may know, he has suggested that he would take a fresh look at his country's policy towards China when he takes office. I can only imagine uh, what the president-elect and leaders in Guatemala and Honduras are thinking after President Trump announced that he would cut off aid. So how concerned are you that cutting off U.S. assistance to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador will allow China to fill the void? And secondly, do you think Russia and other nefarious actors will also deepen their engagement with these countries as, as the Trump administration disengages? And I hope it's not too late for the president to reverse his policy on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm quite concerned about the role that China plays in the hemisphere. I, I think what we've seen and what we saw in South America in particular during the commodities boom uh, in an earlier decade was China was extremely engaged as a purchaser of those commodities. A and that fueled growth in many of the countries in the region. And there's nothing wrong with that. So we need to distinguish between economic interaction and trade on a level playing field, which I think is critical, and involvement in infrastructure projects or the new Chinese Development Bank or other things that I think come with serious um, serious harm potentially to these countries and certainly could result in what our military calls becoming partners of choice, which is not something we want to see. Um, I'm concerned about it because I think they don't bring the same values, obviously, but I'm also concerned about it because I think we're leaving a vacuum through more than just our aid. The Chinese have had um, the Confucius centers to teach Chinese all over the hemisphere, while we've frankly reduced um, engagement in our binational centers and in teaching English. That is a way of projecting power and gaining influence. The Chinese have also always made sure they have diplomatic representation in as many countries as possible. You said, you talked about El Salvador changing from recognizing Taiwan. I think the recognition question is less important than do we make sure to have a robust presence diplomatically, economically, as well as in assistance and in um, financing so that the countries will see us as the partner of choice, which is their preference on the whole? Most countries in the region would prefer to work with us. So I am concerned about that. On the, and in general, China has been an economic partner, not a military partner, but that too could change. Um, in the case of Russia, I do have concerns. They tend to focus more on places like Nicaragua and Venezuela than on the rest of Central America. But I do think that there are efforts by the Russians to, if you will, poke us in the eye in our own hemisphere that we need to be aware of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kolakowski, uh, I think there's a misperception that U.S. assistance to the Northern Triangle only comes uh, directly from the uh, State Department uh, and USAID. And so I appreciate you outlining in your testimony the extent to which U.S. law enforcement agencies like the FBI and DEA receive funding from the State Department to operate the region. Uh, during our visit to El Salvador, I had the opportunity to be briefed, as, as did Mr. McCall, by the FBI's Transnational Anti-Gang Task Force which trains local law enforcement and then works closely with them in investigating and taking down gang leadership structures in the U.S. and Central America. Uh, we thought it was truly an impressive effort by the FBI and our local partners, and there are similar task forces in Guatemala and Honduras as well. So these task forces are funded by the State Department, and their work will come to an end 
if the administration moves forward with its ill-advised plan to cut off aid to the region. Let me ask you this as a former police chief and head of CBP, can you please give us a sense of what ending these anti-gang task forces will mean not only for Central America, but also for communities in the United States? M MS-13 is in the United States as well. So what will be the real life impact on our constituents if we were to cut off, cut off aid? Well, thank you, Chairman. I think there are several things that uh, really come into play here. One is that people you know, need to recognize that MS-13 has been around for well over 30 years. Uh, and the beginnings of MS-13, of course, resulted uh, as, uh, were a result of us bringing people that had been arrested that were gang members, uh, predominantly in Southern California to El Salvador without uh, not even notification, let alone any assistance, and, and literally dumping thousands of criminals in, into that country that didn't have the capacity. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that MS-13 grew rapidly there. Since that time, though, I think we've become a lot smarter. The FBI task force that you mentioned is just one component. The IALEA, the International uh, Law Enforcement Training Center uh, in El Salvador, is another example where law enforcement professionals who have been vetted or approved uh, attend that training uh, to improve their forensics, their money laundering, their investigative skills, uh, all of the things that, that help. So it isn't just uh, that ability to identify gang members uh, or criminals, it's also working hard to choke off the money uh, that, that that supplies these gang members. And when that happens, we see some pretty positive results. We also see a level of cooperation and integration of information being exchanged uh, among law enforcement agencies uh, at the federal level, but also that information that is communicated to us is also passed on to our counterparts at the state and local level, thereby making counties and cities, especially along the border uh, in the United States, Safer. So it would be um, uh, disastrous is probably not too strong a word to see those programs cut. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, our, our trip to Latin America was very insightful at a very critical time. I mean, we, we, we do have a crisis at the border, um, 100,000 per month. Um, but I think it's kind of a two-front war approach, if you will. I mean, Mr. Koloski, you and I worked on uh, Border Patrol issues for a long time, and Roberta, Ambassador, yeah, we dealt with State Department, state and law enforcement working together. That's always kind of the key, I I've always thought. And, and um, uh, you know, uh, the chairman and I had actually talked about before this trip and before the president's announcement, um, sort of putting uh, the Central American Regional Security <clears throat> Initiative on steroids. You now we saw Plant Columbia work, we saw Merida, you know, Ambassador Jacobson um, have an impact. And um, I don't think you can ignore the root causes of the problem. You can be reactionary and, and build a wall and stop people from coming in to the United States. Um, and we can have law enforcement and border patrol, which is essential. But you also have to deal with the root cause of the problem. What, what is causing this phenomena? I mean, in my, when I was a federal prosecutor and chairman of Homeland, I mean, it went from the 20-year-old male trying to smuggle drugs, maybe get a job, to these family units. What causes a family to want to leave their country and come up the long, dangerous journey? And I think a lot of it has to do with conditions. Poverty, violence, gangs causes this impact. And I think to the chairman's point, if we withdraw from the region, who's going to fill it? China. We were in El Salvador, the president said, the incoming president said the current president wanted to invite China to take two of their ports, bring their workers in, take over, and bring their 5G into El Salvador. That, that's a takeover. I think this assistance, USAID, 
We saw at-risk youths that were targeted that could go to MS-13 get trained to find a job instead. We saw the INL program, law enforcement. This is what is, from a law enforcement guy, most deeply disturbing is that we're going to cut off our international law enforcement apparatus in Central America. So our FBI and DEA are going to be shut down. They will not be able to conduct investigations where they have arrested and indicted MS-13. How does that make the situation better? If we cut that, if we cut that program, cut it off at its knees. How does that make us safer as a nation? I think it makes it more dangerous as a nation. And I, maybe that I'm, I'm pontificating, but I, you know, as Roberta knows, I'm very passionate about Latin America. I think we've ignored Latin America for a long time. We got a crisis in Venezuela. We also have a historic opportunity there as well. Uh, we got to play this one right. But I think this decision, while it, it does sound appealing, you're sending all these people just cut off foreign assistance. I think as a policymaker, we have to look at what the consequences will be. What is in reality going to happen if we cut all foreign assistance off to these countries? So I, I'll leave that to, as a question, I guess, to the three of you, if you wouldn't mind responding to that. Um, Ranking Member McCall, thank you. And I think you and I have worked together on this issue for quite a long time um, in Mexico, in Central America. And, and frankly, Gil Kurlikowski was one of the finest public servants I've worked with. We really were a team uh, when we worked on these issues. Um, and since I worked for Roger, I know that uh, we worked on these very same issues as well across the aisle as well as across administrations. You have... One of the things that, that really worries me about reduction of aid is you have governments in these countries of varying qualities for partnership, and I'm the first to admit that. There are deep and abiding corruption issues. But with our aid comes great pressure to improve transparency and make sure that government resources are spent on what they should be and go to the people and less get siphoned off not of our aid money, because we're careful with that, but of their own resources. Um, we also work with the private sector. And one of the most successful things that we've done over the last couple of years is create matching programs, where the local private sector puts in at least $1 for every dollar the US government puts in. What happens to those programs? They won't sustain them. The local private sectors will not sustain those programs without our government being part of them. Those have been critical as well. So the multiplier effect of a cutoff of aid, because of the local governments not doing what they should with the money and the local private sector not partnering with us, is really quite dramatic. May I jump in uh, for uh, 30 seconds on this score and address several of the issues? Uh, the Chinese uh, couldn't replace all of this aid with the stroke of a pen. Uh, and they will send that message uh, to the leaders in the region that they are, they are their partners. The Chinese have a very mercantile vision of the world, how they do business. Uh, they will not, for example, when they're investing to the extent they do uh, in the region, uh, have the same commitment we have in, in terms of environment or workers' rights labor rights that are instilled in the uh, CAFTRA agreement. Uh, they will not certainly share our interests uh, in to uh, inculcate a free market, private sector-led uh, economy. And we talk about these countries now as recipients of aid, as if they were mendic mendicant nations. But in point of fact, 10 years ago we were talking about them as economic partners, natural market for our goods, a place where our companies could invest and make a fair return on that investment, build a safer neighborhood uh, as, uh, as part of an economic uh, uh, community. Uh, 
we've lost that in large measure because of the institutions in Central America being destroyed by uh, transnational organized crime. Caught in a vice between Mexico, where they were making at a certain point effective efforts against drug trafficking, and Colombia and Plan Colombia, which pushed uh, these uh, transnational organized crime, crime groups, these narco trafficking groups, into fertile territory where these small, relatively small countries did not have the capacity to resist, do not have the strong democratic institutions, do not have the accountability and the commitment to the rule of law uh, to fend off this threat. And so the, de the, the demand for illegal drugs from this country has destroyed those countries. Uh, and we have a moral responsibility, I believe, to help them pull out of the, uh, pull, pull out of the dive caused uh, uh, by that, the, 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 that institutional destruction. We should also think about uh, the, uh, what we can do to restore the idea of, uh, of a productive economy, not just deal with them as, as, as these poor, desperate countries that need our help, but you know, insist that they reform their economies, insist that they deal with corruption, insist that they deal with uh, uh, the ability of companies to invest uh, or, to, or trade, uh, and do so as a, as, as a good partner. Uh, the, the, uh, the announcement uh, that we were summarily and arbitrarily cutting off aid does not help any of these leaders be a friend of the United States. Uh, it embarrasses them before their own people. It undermines the confidence that we need to have as partners. Uh, Mr. Kur Kurkowski. Just w one quick comment. I would uh, also tell you that um, although our demand for drugs is certainly a, a driver, every one of these countries has a drug problem within the countries, and they have recognized that, whether it's Mexico under the former First Lady, Margarita Zavala, uh, and, and many other countries. So the problem of the drug uh, trafficking doesn't exist just here uh, and, and fund the narco traffickers. <coughs> they also have their own drug issues, and uh, they need to be addressed, and we can help them, because in many ways we've made some progress on our own demand. Can I just ask you, this, you as a CVP guy, and I've known, we've known each other for a long time, what, if we cut off INL, the international law enforcement, if we cut off the FBI and DEA's operations in Central America to investigate, arrest, and indict MS-13, I mean, this is the we can talk about USAID, but the INL piece under state, what are the consequences of that? So all of, these, all of these U.S. law enforcement boots on the ground in those countries and the liaisons uh, are covered under, one, the auspices of the State Department and, uh, and as a result of that funding. Uh, I don't think there's a, 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 any of the boots on the ground, those working law enforcement professionals that are in there and doing that work. Uh, I don't think a single one would tell you that it is not worthwhile, that they haven't seen progress made, and that the work they're doing there not only uh, improves the safety and security in that country, it really makes our own cities and counties safer. And the, chair, and the chairman and I met with them and saw it firsthand, and I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Mr. Ceres, the, uh, the chairman of our Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. Thank you, chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. McCall. First, let me say uh, I commend the ranking member for recognizing the problem of uh, the cutting of the funds. I represent a district that's about 55 to 60 percent Hispanic. A lot of those Hispanics are for the Northern Triangle. I get firsthand information on what is going on in these countries. And what we have here today is a result of this country not paying attention to this region for many, many administrations. I, w I was very, uh, listened to you very closely, Mr. Kalinowski, Kurlikowski, excuse me because you are the first one that has come to this committee and recognized the fact that about for 10 years or 11 years, we were dumping these MS-13 members in these countries, and we weren't even notifying in the country that these people were members of a gang, and the reason they were, they were just dumping them. So what we have today here is a result of our policies over so many years. And now we have a situation where they want to cut the aid 
in my view, is for political purpose to continue stirring this whole idea about immigrants. And Ambassador, I was happy to hear that you mentioned Russia in this area, how they want to stir up. I, I believe, and I told this to the Secretary of State, that part of the problem in Venezuela, part of the problem in Nicaragua, part of this problem is in an effort to destabilize our backyard. It's an effort to destabilize the Western Hemisphere. Because this doesn't happen in a vacuum. This is all well thought out, in my view. And this idea that we react by cutting some of the best programs that are most effective. I was there last year. I was there with Eliana Ross Layton, who was a promoter of these programs. And we saw it firsthand. We went from one program to the other. And they were very effective. But to have a situation now where you're going to just say, no more money that this is going to solve this problem, it's just going to get worse. Because I talk to people day in and day out in my district, in my office, about the, 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 the children, they're afraid of their, they, they have a, a father or they have a mother taking care of a child in El Salvador or in Guatemala or in Honduras. And they have no option. No option whatsoever. Because it's, it's run by thugs, these, these districts, these, these barrios, are run by thugs. So when they take off and somebody gives them some money to take off to come to America, to them this, they, they see a savings of their families. So, you know, I, I don't understand where this policy is coming from. It is just myopic, it's just putting blinders on. And you know what, we're gonna pay the price years down the line. Because we are paying the price now of our policies years ago, where we did not focus on what's going on. And in terms of China, they just see an opportunity. I just read an article where the Chinese bought a piece of property in Panama, where they want to become the Amazon of the Western Hemisphere. I read another article on what they did to Ecuador. 80% of the oil in Ecuador is now taking, that is, that is exported, is taken by the Chinese at a lower price, and they sell it in the market because of the deal that they cut to build all these dams and all these things. They built a dam in Ecuador that has cracks in it. They built it next to a, uh, a, a volcano. I mean, it's just incredible the things that go on there, and we are letting the Chinese go in. I had a, I had a dinner with the, one of the uh, presidents of a university in Colombia. He tells me that in his, uh, in his university, the second most foreign language that he studied is Mandarin. Obviously, uh, English is still the first. So we have to wake up, because before it's over, before we know it, it's going to get worse. And these policies of you know, beating up on these people, they are a victim. You know, I came to America because it was the land of free. I came at the age of 11. And it has always been in the mind of my parents, my relatives, everything else, that we're still the country of the free and the country of opportunity. So I don't know where this policy is going. I hated to see it being so politicized just because you want to build up your base, and you want to build your support, and there's an election coming up, we just better wake up. And I really don't have a question. I have another meeting, and, and I thank you for being here. Always nice to see a Jersey girl come before us, you know, and I apologize if I'm, you know, too strong. So do you want to say anything, Ambassador? Well, thank you. The only thing I would say is I do agree that one of the things we did you know, all of us that served in government or before, the wars ended in Central America and we all saw a peace dividend. And we didn't think as much as we needed to about young men with weapons in Central America and no jobs to replace that. Um, and, and we closed down missions and we, we uh, reduced programs. And, and Roger's absolutely right. 
you know, just like the drug problem has supply and demand issues, so does migration. Um, yes, migrants are coming. They're also being manipulated by people who tell them they can get in even if they can't, and the smuggling has to be stopped. But you got to work on both ends of this problem. Um, it isn't going to end unless we work on the root causes, not sustainably. Ambassador? Yeah, I, I know your time has gone over, but just a bit. That's all right. Just make one comment, Mr. Mr. Jim Chairman. Is a I'm, of mine. I'm not surprised to see the. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not surprised to see the remarkable bipartisan commitment to these programs, a recognition uh, by people who who understand these programs, who who visit and and see for themselves uh, the the benefits. Uh, I, I would hope that you would work together uh, to appeal to uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and to others, the Vice President Pence, who's paid some attention to the region, that the President needs to do a, 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 to reconsider. Uh, we certainly can't just scrap these programs for the year and then start in the next fiscal year. Uh, it, it's an absolutely unmanageable. Uh, situation or our diplomats uh, there without the tools they need to do their job. It's an unmanageable situation. So I would hope that uh, you could communicate with these people directly in a bipartisan way, the highest levels, both the uh, House and Senate, uh, with the President to, to uh, you know, press upon them the need to, to reconsider this decision. Well, good, good advice. Thank you. Mr. Chabot. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is a very interesting hearing, and I agree, and uh, I've listened closely to comments on, on both sides of the aisle here, and I think for what their work, I think you're, I think you're all right. I think the witnesses are all right here, too. This is extremely frustrating. I think it is for the President uh, as well. One of these on the one hand, on the other hand things. I think the President uh, realizes that we've sent uh, a lot of foreign aid down to a number of these countries, uh, particularly in, in Central America. And there's a, and a more or less supposed to be an agreement that the money goes down there, it goes to improve conditions there, uh, help law enforcement actually enforce their laws. Um, it should assist us in reducing illegal immigration, which is one of the top uh, promises that the president has made to actually do something about it. Others have talked about it. He's really trying to do something about him, and I think that I think that's uh, that's commendable that the president is trying to do something. Um, however, the, the money apparently either hasn't been effectively utilized. Uh, the caravans are still happening, and I think the president thinks that we're being, you know used as a sucker in this thing. You know, it should be a cooperative effort. There should be good faith when we send them money. Uh, it should be being put to good use. And I think the president's mindset is more, at this point, he's frustrated. It's kind of tough love. Um, and, uh, and I understand that. I do tend to think that we ought to continue to work with these nations to assist them uh, in improving the conditions that cause parents to want to send their young people up here uh, to get away from the cartels and the drug gangs where it's my understanding that literally uh, their lives are threatened and, and oftentimes they are physically harmed or, or killed um, if they don't cooperate with the drug gangs. Uh, and so it's understandable that they would want to get their, their kids out of, away from that sort of thing. Um, on the other hand, how long does this go on where uh, these countries do not cooperate in, for example, stopping the cartels? There ought to be, excuse me, stopping the caravans. There, there ought to be uh, some mechanism uh, that we can work on with them uh, to, to at least cease these major caravans from continuing uh, to come to our, our southern border, and, the, and Mexico has been uh, sometimes somewhat cooperative, but mostly not cooperative. Um, they could stop by stopping the caravans from entering into their southern border, uh, but they haven't been particularly helpful there. Um, but it's very frustrating. I've been to, to Guatemala and Honduras and talked to various groups there. Uh, in, uh, in the very near future, I'm going to be in uh, El Salvador and, and Nicaragua also, and, and talk to people down there on the ground. Uh, but 
but it's frustrating. And I, I again, I completely understand the president's uh, mindset here, and I sympathize with it. I don't necessarily agree with it 100 percent. I don't think I would say let's cut it off altogether right now. Uh, but I'm getting closer and closer to that if these countries don't cooperate. So uh, in, in espousing that uh, frustration, I see some nodding of heads on the panel there. So I'll just open it up and ask you to comment in any way that you, you see fit. Uh, Ambassador Noriega, Seven. if you want yeah. to first. Uh, before you came in, I, I made the point that obviously the president was re reacting to the fact that the number had surged to roughly 100,000 in, in March. Uh, on the southwest border, uh, up from 70,000. And it is a fact that the smugglers are gaming our system. Uh, and so, the, but the decision to cut off aid doesn't hit the smugglers. As a matter of fact, some of our aid is to dismantle the smuggling operations. A lot of what we do in terms of law enforcement uh, and anti-gang work is precisely to go after the smuggling organizations. Uh, and, and so uh, there's, a, there's another issue, uh, and that's on the uh, asylum claims. I, I do, on a, you know, every two or three months, I, on a pro bono basis, uh, do testimony before uh, judges on asylum, uh, asylum cases. Some are better than others, quite frankly. Uh, and, but a, a good number of these people clearly do not have uh, 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 well-founded fear of persecution, and they have, they're, they're here for economic reasons. Uh, but they understand that because we have such a backlog in the, in the handling of these asylum cases, that if they do an asylum uh, claim, by law, we just sort of let them go. And they're, they're asked to call back. Now, if you can reduce the amount of time for have, having a hearing, you have a better chance of them showing up. Uh, and then you, you deport the people who are, 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 are uh, ineligible. One of the recommendations that the Migration Policy Institute, uh, Andrew Seeley, has made is uh, allowing uh, CIS, uh, Immigration Services Asylum Officers, to make those determinations. Mm -hmm. uh, so you reduce the backlog and you get an immediate response and, and you start to turn these people back. Uh, you know, we're not hard-hearted people by any means, but we have to be sort of hard-headed when you think of millions of more Central Americans who are ready to pay $5,000 a person if they're moving as a family unit uh, to get on a bus and come here because the smugglers have commercialized the caravans. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, my time's expired, but if I could just say we absolutely have to, in a bipartisan manner, change this ridiculous uh, asylum policy that we have now where people can come up, they're told by the cartels the magic words to say, they say it, then they're cited to court, you know, a year, two years down the road, they disappear into the population, never come back for their hearing, and then they're just here. We, we have to do something about that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shabbat. Now, I'm going to call on Mr. Deutsch, but we've had uh, votes on the, on the floor, so we could either finish before or we could come back, whatever. Uh, I'll, just, I'll be quick. Okay. I, I'll dispense with the uh, statement I was going to make and, and just ask, I, I, Mr. Shabbat raises, I, I think, fairly succinctly, the, the way this argument is playing out, that we're just, President's just administering some tough love, that, that we're tired of being played the sucker. Um, what, what to, to the points that you made earlier, um, what would your message be? What, what would leadership look like here that recognizes that we're not cutting off aid that's, <clears throat> that's going to governments, <clears throat> as you've all pointed out, we're cutting off aid that actually benefits us and our security and improves the lives of people on the ground. Um, what, what, what should be done, aside from not cutting off the aid, what would leadership look like in the region? What would it look like if the president said, I need everyone around the table who can make some commitment to help address this situation? Who would be at the table and what, what, what should be discussed? Well, uh, Congressman, I think one of the most important things is they need to discuss governance, and they need to make commitments to governance, which is one of the things we demand of those leaders in the region, right? And that means they need to focus on greater tax income from tax evasion so they have funds to support their security forces. They need to work with us on these specialized units, which help both the, get rid of and dismantle the smuggling operations 
and help us fight gangs and narcotics trafficking. We need to focus on the things that work best at both ends, and we need to do it in such a way that it's transparent to the people in their countries, and there is no graft, which we do well, where we do it. Um, but we also need to work with the private sectors in those countries, which have been lamentably slow in committing to being good citizens on security issues. When President Uribe in Colombia started with Plan Colombia, he told his private sector, you have to pay to make the country safe. You who have funds need to pay your taxes and be part of it. We haven't seen that in Central America. There was one effort in Honduras. But the other thing I just want to mention is, um, I, I'm sorry to have to say this, but these countries cannot stop people from leaving, whether in caravans or not. What that looks like is a Berlin Wall, and I don't think that's what we're asking them to do. It is people's right to leave their country, whether we like it or not. Mexico just recently announced they're going to put more people at the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, the narrowest point. Those are the kinds of things we need to see. And if, and if we, for our other panelists, if we want to have those kinds of discussions, which would actually be fruitful and would help us address this, is it, is it easier or harder for us to convene those meetings when we're cutting off aid and when we're talking about ending assistance altogether and closing our border? Mr. Kurlikowski. So, so I, would, I would certainly tell you that uh, uh, during my time, we saw incredible success mm -hmm. with Mexico. ANAMI, which is their immigration system, and they don't have uh, enforcement uh, powers, they don't carry firearms, et cetera, yet they put huge numbers of resources on the border with Guatemala. Every one of us, I think, can remember those pictures of the trains, La Bestia, with thousands of people hanging on the sides and the roofs. They ended that. They stopped that. They did, uh, they did a variety of, of important work uh, in cooperation, and they exchanged a lot of good information. And frankly, treating those individuals uh, uh, in, the, in the higher levels of government with the greatest courtesy and respect, I think, went a long way to doing diplomacy and then creating a better system. Yeah. So the short answer is harder. Yeah. Harder. And just the last thing I'd say, I, I want to just, I, I can't let Mr. Shabbat's comments about asylum seekers simply set out there. The idea that, that people who are willing to, to risk their lives to travel to our country, um, who have a right to claim asylum uh, for fear of persecution in their own countries, to suggest that somehow all of them are coming here because they've been uh, they've been tricked or because they're, uh, they're somehow being used uh, is, is not only unfair to them and their families and the risk that they're taking to be here, uh, but it actually ch it, it challenges the very nation of the kind of country that we have and want to have. And I, I, I'm so grateful for the service that all three of you uh, have provided and for your testimony today. I'm, I'm, thank you, Mr. Deutsch. Um, we have, we're getting down to the, to the bottom, so I'm going to call on Mr. Yoho for two minutes. And then um, Mr. Cicilline for two minutes, and we'll try to make it before the votes are on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We don't have to have them come back. We'll have you come another time. I Thank would you. love for you to come back, but I understand. Um, Ambassador Jacobson, you were saying how the root cause of migration, and we, I think we know this, lack of jobs, violence, and all, everything goes on. Um, I'm, I'm a veterinarian, and what we do is we look at a sick animal, we, we do a diagnostic, and then we formulate a treatment plan. We treat it, but if the treatment doesn't work, We've got to change the treatment or re reassess the situation. And um, since 2008 to 2018, we have put $5.75 billion into Central America, a minimum of that. And then we've put $2 trillion on the war on drugs since it started, $2 billion in Mexico alone, yet Mexico is supplying 93% of the heroin coming into the United States. Mexico is. You can't do that without government involvement. And of course, we saw the allegations that um, uh, President Pena was bribed $100 million by uh, El Chapo. You can't have legitimate, uh, the narco trafficking has become a legitimized business. And it's been accepted. And they, what they have done is they've run their money to le legal businesses that is funneled they're funneling this illegal money that's coming here. And so I'm not opposed to what President Trump is um, uh, proposing because what we've done is not working. And so without being able to go into this further, 
I think we need to look at how we're dealing with this, and it has to be dealt differently. It's a decay on all societies, and it's happening here, and it's not benefiting the people of any of those countries, and it's putting men at risk, but it puts our country at risk, and it weakens our economies. I'm not asking for a response. Uh, it's just something we need to look at. And one last thing, 90-plus percent of all Latin American countries are Christian nations, as we are. I don't think we're following the Christian doctrine of treat others as you would treat ourselves, and I think we need to look at all of that. And um, yep. I yield my time. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Yoho. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, I want to thank uh, the chairman of our committee for convening this and the ranking member, and thank the witnesses for their uh, extraordinary testimony and for their service to our country. Uh, we're here today to discuss the importance of U.S. assistance to Central America an issue on which there is broad bipartisan support across this committee and across the Congress. Uh, through assistance and development programs, the United States is able to address the root causes of instability and the drivers of migration to the United States. These are programs that tackle corruption, promote education, foster democracy, and counter violence. They represent an effective investment on the part of the United States to promote a more stable, more democratic, and more prosperous hemisphere. In fact, the Vice President himself noted their importance, and I quote, to further stem the flow of illegal immigration and illegal drugs into the United States, President Trump knows, as do all of you, that we must confront these problems at their source. We must meet them and we must solve them in Central America and South America, end quote. Those are the words of the Vice President. Yet this administration, or actually I can't even say the administration because this is really the President acting on a whim, yet this President rashly announced an end to all aid and then to programs that help stem migration because he wants to end migration. Uh, as is typical, this represents the president's pension for making up policy on the fly, leaving his own administration, our diplomats, and other countries surprised, confused, and scrambling to undo the damage. Uh, I would like now to enter into the record a statement from Plan International USA based in Rhode Island, which notes, and I quote, the administration must begin to view foreign assistance for what it is, a way to improve conditions and strengthen institutions within foreign countries while also enhancing our own security, end quote. Without objection, it's in the record. And also I'd like to enter into the record an op-ed by Ambassador Jacobson from the New York Times in which she describes the disorder of the Trump administration as seen in her role as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. It highlights the alarming disorganization, lack of foresight, and baffling ignorance of the Trump administration. The decision to end aid in Central America is sadly par for the course, which is why, in my view, Congress must exercise oversight. This country will never be able to address immigration if we do not address the root drivers of irregular migration. Those who immigrate to the, our great country have, in many instances, experienced unbearable hardships. Our assistance programs help to address the underlying causes of these hardships. Cutting them would be cruel, short-sighted, and counterproductive. And I believe that Congress must take clear, bold action to ensure key assistance programs are not gutted just because of a presidential mood swing. So I want to begin uh, my question. Uh, as I mentioned, development, uh, development organization called Plan USA is based in my district and has worked in Central America for decades. Their field work and their research demonstrate the value of U.S. assistance to the region uh, for improving people's lives and preventing migration. In fact, a plan survey found that 59 percent of at-risk youth in El Salvador, as an example, plan to migrate because of violence and lack of opportunity. So PLAN runs a youth employment program that has trained thousands of youth for jobs with dozens of companies akin to the excellent programs run by USAID. Isn't that fundamentally a better way to address this problem, a program like that, Ambassador Jacobson? It, it absolutely is. I mean, I think that those kinds of programs are critical. Um, while obviously you still see migrants coming, and in fact right now you're seeing larger numbers, so you can argue over how effective they are. But the truth is over the last couple of years, we, we do know what works. Plan USA know what, knows what works. Um, what we need to do is expand their reach and demand that those governments replicate those programs. And, and I would say to Representative Yoho, who talked about things not working, it's true that the smugglers and the drug traffickers are always going to be more agile than governments. So we are constantly going to have to adapt our programs. And that's exactly what we have done over the past few years. Um, 
we know certain things work and others were abysmal failures. Um, but the programs that we're looking at right now were only just getting started. And so to say that they had failed is really way too preliminary um, without a significant continuation of funding and talking with partners like those NGOs who know what works. And, you know, and I think in addition to that, the, just the very announcement of these proposed cuts has already damaged U.S. aid programs and really the, our credibility in Central America. Uh, PEPFAR has canceled its annual planning meeting for the Western Hemisphere. USAID has frozen a number of ex activities, and one person in the region even described it as government shutdown mode. So the idea of the difficulties that, that come with restarting it when organizations have begun to and, you know, uh, make adjustments for this pronouncement is significant. Two other quick questions, because I know my time has run out, but I'm in charge, so I can have a couple more minutes. Um, on March 28th, uh, just before President Trump announced that he was cutting off aid to Central America, recently resigned Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, announced what she called a historic agreement with our partners in Central America to address the root causes of migration. In other words, the U.S. government got agreement from countries in the region uh, to what the administration wanted, and the president responded by trying to punish them. It's sort of baffling. And my question really is, what does the president's decision to cut off aid to Central America despite strong support from members of his own administration, including his own vice president, say about uh, his approach to foreign policy and our ability to kind of have a coherent response to this crisis. And what, what does it say to the, to the leaders in the region who are trying to figure this out? I don't know who might try to answer that. Ambassador? Well, I don't think anybody uh, thinks that this was a well-reasoned uh, decision or announcement. Uh, Roberta, as Assistant Secretary of State, uh, and I, in that same role, did annual reviews of all of our projects uh, with USAID, what's effective, what's working, what's not, are we prepared to defend them before the Secretary of State, arm wrestle members of Congress and, and their staff, uh, accept the kind of oversight that really enriches the programs, and we did this uh, because we believe that, and we're absolutely convinced that this sort of investment is in our interest. I will say one thing that I'm, I am concerned is we are sort of treating the symptoms of countries that are in very serious trouble because their basic institutions have been undermined by uh, transnational organ organized cr criminal organizations. That uh, can bribe or bully or murder to get whatever they want. And this is, the transnational organized crime is $2.2 trillion. That's the equivalent of Mexico's GDP. And to suggest that, that the country of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala are on their own when they're to a certain extent victims of, of this uh, demand for illicit drugs, I think is not, uh, is not reasonable. Uh, we need the partnerships, and we also need, as I said, to do more than treat symptoms. We need economies growing again. We need uh, governments uh, uh, tackling corruption, uh, adopting the right economic policies. You saw a country of El Salvador, for example, go from civil war to investment grade in five or six years without turning to uh, multilateral development banks for the, for the resources. Uh, it can be done with the right policies, with the political will but we have to be good partners uh, to, to accompany that process. Thank you. During my eight years in the administration, we <coughs> didn't do planning and we didn't do policy on the fly or on the whim. There was an incredible amount of cooperation and backup and support and work that was done. And also, uh, I think all of us worked very hard to break down silos. Uh, between the State Department or USAID and CBP or DHS and on and on. Uh, and it took, a, a, it took a long time and it was important. And it was important also that we weren't uh, surprised or that we found out about new policy by reading it in the paper or hearing it. I, I didn't follow Twitter very well. But, right. uh, uh, and so when I look at the success in Mexico and I look at those reductions, I look at the success in those three Central American countries, which I wish I would have had a little time to, uh, to explain to uh, member Yoho, but uh, we've made great progress. 
And as Roberta also mentioned, these programs are in their infancy. I mean, right. Give them a chance to flourish. And then if they're not working, you know, let's say they're not working and we need to move on. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. And my final question, you know, there's been a lot of discussion this hearing about the level of assistance and us being taken for suckers and what we're spending. I think it's important to note that our foreign assistance to the Northern Triangle makes up just 0.00035% of the U.S. federal budget and provides a significant return on investment by improving security and economic opportunity in the region. The small investment has had a catalytic effect when the U.S. committed a $420 million to the region in fiscal year 17. Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador committed to more than 10 times that amount, $5.4 billion, to support investments in their people and to strengthen public safety. Given the administration's focus on burden sharing, uh, I'd love to hear your views with respect to the proposal to cut off U.S. assistance in the region and whether it would, in fact, end up undermining uh, Northern Triangle countries' uh, uh, willingness to continue to make the kinds of investments they've made in light of, uh, of the U.S. investment. Ambassador Jacobson. Um, Representative Cicilline, I think that is an extremely important point. Um, what I mentioned earlier about multiplier effect of our assistance, there is no place that I know of in the Western Hemisphere where we've put in more money than the local government. In Mexico, I think it was 17 or 18 dollars for every one of ours. In Central America, you noted. In Colombia, certainly, the Colombians dedicated um, massive resources to this. And what happens when we are unreliable, when we cut aid, is some of those programs don't continue. Um, because what we're signaling is maybe it's not such a priority, even though the president obviously is speaking out of frustration uh, and wanting to do more. <coughs> these are hard programs. They're hard politically for these leaders. They are, um, they're working to, to get at entrenched interests, both economic and political, as well as security, if you will. And so to take those risks without our support without our backing, becomes harder and harder. It is, the chances grow slimmer that they will do things we want without our moral backing as well as financial backing. Um, but we've also seen that we get much weaker response from the local private sector, economic elites who can afford to contribute and who say, well, if the U.S. isn't going to be supporting this we're not going to bother. So yeah, there is a there's a multiplier effect in our cuts. Yeah, which is why I hope this hearing communicates to the White House the urgency of reconsidering their position because these investments are not acts of charity. They are investments in the safety and security of the world, which is in the national security interests of the American people. And this is about getting to the root of a problem, which is presenting challenges to our own country and. Uh, there is bipartisan understanding of that. Your testimony today helped uh, reaffirm that, and I again will end where I began by thanking you for your testimony today and for your extraordinary service to our country. And uh, with that, today's hearing is concluded. And the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>